Yeah, so Peggy gave a fantastic introduction to the incredible biology of echidnas. So I'm a PhD student at the University of Adelaide. Uh, a bit of a shameless plug because I am a student. I am involved in the student best talk competition. So if you do enjoy what I'm talking about today and think I did a good job, please vote for me. That'd be fantastic. Um, <laughs> So, and I need to acknowledge that all of the photos in this presentation have been from this Echidna CSI Citizen Science Project so far, and there are some incredible, incredible photos that have been sent in. Uh, so, rather than the ecological aspects um, of echidnas, I'm actually interested in their molecular biology. So, um, and using the knowledge that we can gain through this to help with their conservation. So, echidnas are an iconic Australian species. Um, and as Peggy just said, we, there is so much about their biology that's taken so long to learn and there's still so many gaps that we just do not understand. We don't really know what their, even their distributions are across the entire of Australia. So there's only two well-studied populations, the one that's on Kangaroo Island, and Tasmania has had a lot of um, research done as well. But you've got the entire of continent Australia that is um, almost hardly any data on the exact of their wild um, populations there which is incredibly important. If the Kangaroo Island population is listed as endangered now, we need to get this information to find out what the health of echidnas around the rest of the country are. So this is a, um, oh, and the reason that, you know, it's really, really difficult to study these creatures is they're not often like that. They're more often, that's gonna show, aha, like that. And if you can't see them, that's where they are. <laughs> And this is actually photos that the citizen scientists have actually been able to grab. Um, so there's a few key questions that we're particularly interested in. First of all, what are their current distributions and how can we change, uh, track that through time? Also, what is their diet? We know that they eat uh, a range of species of ants and termites, but there's also anecdotal evidence of them eating other insects, but you can't see them physically in the scats, so we don't know what they are. What is their genetic diversity like across the country? Um, that's what all those colourful circles are meant to represent. Uh, how stressed are they? Are there particular um, populations that are more stressed than others, such as ones that are living in more suburban areas? And how active are they reproducing out in the wild? And also importantly is being able to answer all of those questions for different populations around Australia so that we can compare them. So that's where the birth of Echidna CSI came from. Uh, this is obviously a huge task, and there is no way that uh, individual researchers can do this. Um, even just on a small island like Kangaroo Island, it's taken 30 years of work. Uh, so we wanted to be able to use um, citizens to help with, this, with these issues. So we developed an app to make this as simple and usable as possible across the country, uh, asking people to do two things. First of all is to record echidna sightings whenever they see them by taking a photo and it will GPS track their location. But um, more importantly is actually getting them to collect echidna scats. So as a molecular biologist, that's why I'm interested in uh, this side of the project. Because what Pooh can do uh, is answer all of these really cool, uh, really interesting questions. So we know that there's an abundance of DNA and hormone, uh, DNA in their uh, scats that can give you an indication of what species they're eating, um, and also the DNA from the echidnas themselves, so you can look at their population diversity. And there's also a range of hormones in their scats as well, so that can give us an indication of uh, how stressed they are, and even if they're, say, pregnant, or uh, if it's a breeding male, and things like that. So we launched in September last year, uh, and it was fantastic. We did a big media release. Um, and had uh, a heap of um, media attention around the release. And that is me and my supervisor, Frank, uh, at Adelaide Zoo doing the, the launch. Uh, and the idea behind this was so that we could get the news crews to film um, some footage of the echidna at the zoo, but they couldn't find it in the enclosure. So it was a really great um, start to the project, being like, well, of course we can't do it. If we can't even find it in a you know, few meter square enclosure, how are we meant to find them out in the wild? Which was very, very interesting. So today we have uh, about 1,700 people subscribed through our app. Uh, we've had over 1,000 submissions already, which is amazing, and we've been sent in 100 scats. People literally package them up, put them in an envelope, and mail them to us, uh, which has been interesting. And so through the process of this project, 
Uh, this is the distribution, um, the number of submissions that have been sent in per day um, from the launch in September till today. And what you can see is that trend of um, it's starting out very, very a large peak as we released and then dropping. And then there's a couple of um, peaks in there as well. So I expected a bit of a decrease because echidnas don't like the heat. So moving into summer, I didn't expect as many submissions to be coming in. But what's interesting is that there are a couple of peaks um, which the first one is when we did a uh, Totally Wild episode. Um, and so that got released on that day, and so that got a huge um, uptake in um, downloads and submissions. And the second one is actually the Atlas of Living Australia released a blog. Um, so they, uh, and was uh, shared by CSIRO, and we got a huge, like another 400 downloads overnight or something ridiculous, and an uptake, um, uptake in submissions as well. So the media is a really, really powerful thing. So I'm really interested to see uh, if, we look at the data this year, with the more and more uptake we get, if we do see that decline over summer, or if that was just a trend of not having enough media bumps along the way through summer. So this is an Australia-wide project, and so this is a, these are the submissions we have gotten so far. Um, we were su super, super excited with the uptake that it actually um, had. But as you can see, it's very localised to the areas that are high in population density. So a goal of ours this year is to really start pushing out to as many programs as we can and also particularly to get into those rural areas um, and even go through education systems and potentially try and get into the indigenous um, groups as well because they are occupying those areas that, um, uh, that is blank at the moment. So we want to get that information as much as possible. This is the uh, amount of uh, submissions uh, individual gifts. So the majority of people are putting in one to two submissions, which is expected. This is uh, meant to be a opportunistic, whenever you see an echidna out in the wild, you grab it, which is very rare for some people. And other people, they see a lot. So these four people in particular have made a huge contribution and really shows the range of this project from people that can come in and out as they please, or people, people such as Peter Haswell, who lives on Kangaroo Island, has made a huge effort around his particular area, tracking the um, echidnas that come on and off his property, collecting an abundance of scats for us, and it's been a really, really cool thing to see how many people are adopting this for their own. So what am I actually doing with the poo? So let me just start by saying that echidna scats, or scats in general, are really, really hard to work with on a molecular biology sense. So if you imagine this as beautiful, fresh DNA from some great tissue, it's long and intact and fantastic and does all the things you want to do later. This is what DNA from a scat looks like. It is broken up into little pieces, it's highly damaged, uh, and it's in low concentration. So what you're doing is you're dealing with also outside contamination. So if I touched it or if I breathed on it, I would be putting my DNA in there which would overtake it. So you've got to really um, be battling with these things. But Luckily, I've gotten to the point where I am able to extract the DNA out of these echidna scats, which is fantastic. Um, and you're not just getting DNA from the echidnas, you're getting DNA from the food that they've eaten and also from the bacteria or fungi around them as well and also the bacteria that's living in their gut. So it means that we are going to be able to sequence everything out of that scat, get all of that information to understand things about their microbiome from the bacteria, the genetic diversity from the echidna and the diet from the food that they've eaten.